good old SoundCloud to the rescue. Put on popular tracks. And we will do Trials and Trails. Milton Sierra, astronomer with modern Galileo. Trials and Trails. I do not understand this. The gravity only Big Bang redshift expanding universe idea that has been around since I can remember was disproven by Halton Arp, by Halton C. Arp in 1966, and again by Eric Lerner in 1996. Astronomer Arp was looking at peculiar galaxies, of which he wrote an atlas of them. In 1966, he noticed that higher energy galaxies... All right, Greg, I'm going to split. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll watch your video tomorrow, too. ...had okay, supercharged Take core care. and were spitting out quasars. Now, he has noticed that these quasars were not at the edges of the known universe. That standard model cosmologist wanted people to think that they were, but they are populated near the parent galaxy. For example, galaxy NGC 7603 has several of these quasar bodies populated close to the galaxy, connected by filament of charged plasma. Each quasar has a different rate of recession, and ARP correctly figured out that if they were all connected to the parent galaxy, then a huge part of redshift had to be intrinsic and non-cosmological, meaning that it meant more, it was associated more with their age. Also, they were changing quite rapidly, and they yeah, they were changing quite rapidly in quantum jumps as they aged and gained mass to one day eventually become a companion galaxy. In other words, what we what he was observing was nothing less than biology in space. No need for a Big Bang or inflation. Now, this really was treated with, like, it was hilarious. And he was laughed at when he first proposed it, uh, is what I hear. Much like they laughed at Velikovsky, who turned out to be right. Anyway, Dr. R wrote a paper to the Bible of Standard Model Cosmology, the Astrophysical Journal. He knew that this was going to e was going to eclipse not only the once upon a time nothing exploded story, but faulty inflation too. But what did science do after giving out so many Nobel Prizes in physics for dead wrong theories? Did they admit the mistake? and write about the new discoveries of Halton Art, which would have put him easily in the Einstein care classification of scientists, probably would have made him the greatest cosmologist in the 20th century. Mr. Menzel and Sagan didn't like that. Needless to mention, they were already in a huff over Velikovsky. No, very disappointingly, they chose to deep-six it. Hubble warned modern cosmologists and math-happy physicists not to jump to conclusions, but it was too late. They took it and ran with it. The early 1930s, front-page news, the universe is expanding. No, it's not. But wrong, period. They had been waiting for something that they could latch on to, and this was it. Big funding, here we come. Arp's telescope time was taken away, and he was told that if he didn't change his research, he would have to find another job. So Dr. Arp did the only thing he really could do. 
he resigned in protest. His research, he would have, oh, probably broken-hearted. He was also ostracized and blackballed in the United States. This is why he is now called the modern Galileo. It really just completely gives me this terrible feeling of disillusionment in the in mankind's intelligence and has been bought out. Something that I never thought would happen. But it is better to be disillusioned than to continue to live with the illusion. So, at least it's not like that. That is all it is. Modern cosmology goes to the highest bidder. Dissenters are suppressed and covered up. Just like President John F. Kennedy said, in 1961 in a speech to Congress. American institutions of learning, mass media, social networking sites, and, well, everything is in on the corruption. They shut down truth-tellers as hate speech. Isn't that something? How could a scientist continue to go through all the motions when in their hearts they know they're wrong? They have to. They're hiding the truth from the world. I, I can't get past that. I can't get over it. So imagine, you just discovered knowledge that would completely change the science we know and love as cosmology but instead of being hailed and rewarded for improving the queen of the sciences, which would and will change the whole world, especially medicine, you were forced to resign by the Palomar Observatory and the high priestess, the moron named Menzel, with his panty-waisted protege, Carl Sagan, who trolled and torpedoed Velikovsky every chance he got. Velikovsky's book, Worlds in Collision, put mainstream science on its ear in 1950. Sagan's only job then was to follow around Dr. Velikovsky, claiming to have debunked him with nothing but lies. I lost any and all respect I once had for Sagan with a little less. Who, by the way, his name backwards is Nagas, the famed alien species. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? Many will know he made his name by creating an anti-theory theory called the super greenhouse gas effect for Venus to try to steal Velikovsky's thunder when he claimed that Venus, he predicted that Venus, this was before the space age, in the 50s, he claimed that Venus would be at least 600 degrees Fahrenheit. To which the key masters, if you will, had a real hoot and hurrah over. But he didn't stop there. He predicted water on Mars and the moon, radio emissions from Jupiter and Saturn, and that these two beauties were actually former stars. More hurrahs. That's a Texas term for laughing at someone. However, the part of the story you may not know was in 1962, all of Velikovsky's theories were proven correct. So the two biggest troublemakers for modern gaslight-era horse-and-buggy cosmology should be known as the two greatest scientists of the 20th century. But alas, it wasn't meant it wasn't to be. 
we find these truths we hold to be self-evident. But they both still sit in virtual obscurity. I don't know about you, but when I saw all of this, I couldn't sit still for a week. People had to know. And I just dove right in and started telling. Because to me, this is finding truth is like a great liberation. You don't feel like the wool has been pulled over your eyes when you know better. You know different. And it has all the evidence on its side. Dr. Arp, he was offered and accepted a position at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He quickly and quietly very high electric force charges throughout space, he found. Dr. Arp found also very high electric charges in space. And we'll get to that a little later. Anyways, he wrote the book Seeing Red, which carries a dual meaning, passed away in 2013. And Dr. Velikovsky passed in 1979, sadly. But meanwhile, Saturn, or stan meanwhile, standard model trickery knows no bounds. So to make the quasars disappear, the mathematicians came in and said, okay, this is what's called gravitational lensing. You're not really looking at four quasars, you're just looking at one, which has to be even more nonsense than the first two. It's just ridiculous. The mathematicians came in. They said, okay, mathematically speaking, the universe must be running away at the speed of light. Arp knew this was lunacy. The paper was returned to him with nothing other than the editor writing across the top. This exceeds my imagination. He didn't have any imagination, apparently. That should have been all the more reason to have it looked at and take a look at the evidence. Molten Arp gathered his evidence. He moved to Germany to work for Planck, which he compiled a mountain of evidence. For his troubles, his paper was not even sent to a referee, which is what should be done to correct the error by standard model within the network. ARP was considered an outsider for not fully accepting all of their paradigms, which begs the question, why do paradigms exist in the first place? Aren't they a little ridiculous? Now that you know all of this, please take a look at the evidence. The more evidence you find, the more you will know that I speak the truth. As long as it is not being filtered to you by someone with an agenda. But I am convinced you will be too that our universe is not something where they can create all of these phony dark and black things like matter, energy, black holes, all mathematical con constructs. Here are a few very good videos to research. The Cosmology Quest, Part 1 and 2, you'll find them in the description. Besides giving you ARP's evidence, that is overwhelming, actually, that the work of Emanuel Velikovsky as well. He was a very serious man of integrity and honor. 
and I have been reading his books for four, almost five years, and as of yet I have not found one misinformation, mistruth, or something that sounded ad hoc or concocted. All of his theories are very well thought out, and he uses mainstream science to back him up. So he uses their own science against them. And they just got really angry, just, you know, started wringing their hands saying that he was a psychologist and he had no business being in the cosmology field. Hmm. That's pretty funny. Emmanuel Velikovsky also predicted water on Mars and that Saturn and Jupiter were actually former stars. And all of his theories have been proven correct. I do not know of anything that he got wrong. And, well, here we sit. It's just, it's really sad to think about. He put all that work, his life's work, and he just got deep sixed. And it's just, I, I, it's so unjust. I don't even know where to begin with it. But if you take a look at the evidence like I did, you too will be convinced that our universe is not something where they can create all this phony stuff. Our universe is electric. Plain and simple. I, I really have a lot of affection for both men because they were men of integrity and somewhat role models for me. I just, I'm very impressed with men who make a stand because they believe in something they know is right. Not a lot of people do that these days, especially do it and still make a living. If you want to make a living, you have to go with the flow, as they say. All right, I just wanted to make sure that Anyone that happened to catch this and might not know about the situation, you have been formally introduced. Thank you. Chapter 14, The Golden Age and Nova of Super Saturn. The Great...
Hyperborea. Mythical land that fascinated writers of the ancient world. Hyperborea is a location in Greek mythology. The inhabitants, the inhabitants of this mythical land are known as Hyperboreans, whom the ancient Greeks believed enjoyed extremely long lives. Hyperborea is mentioned by a number of Greek and Roman writers, including Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, and Pindar. Although Hyperborea is a mythical land, there has been speculation over the ages that it is a real place on Earth. This has led to a number of theories about the exact location. In addition, attempts have been made to connect the Hyperboreans with real historical peoples. The name Hyperborea may be translated to mean beyond the north wind, which is an indication of where the ancient Greeks thought this land was located. According to the Greek mythology, the north wind, personified by the god Boreas, lived in Thrace. Therefore, Hyperborea would logically be placed to the north of Thrace. Hyperborea, however, was one of the terra incognita, Latin for unknown lands, of the ancient Greeks and Romans. These were regions which have neither been mapped nor documented. In other words, Hyperborea might very well be a place that exists only in myth, and many of the stories told about Hyperborea and the Hyperboreans are quite unbelievable. Hyperborea mentioned repeatedly by Herodotus. One of the ancient writers who mentions Hyperborea many times in his work is the Greek historian Herodotus. The so-called father of history wrote about the Hyperborea in book four of his histories. In one part of his book, Herodotus writes, Aristeas, the son of Kistrabos, who came from Proconesus, claimed in a poem that he visited the Isodones in a state of inspiration by Apollo, that beyond the Isodones lived a one-eyed race called Arimaspi, Arimaspians. 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 Beyond the, beyond them there would, beyond them there is a land of gold guarding griffins. And beyond them, the Hyperboreans, all the way to the sea. All these people from the Aram Aramaspians. Aramaspians on except the Hyperboreans are constantly attacking their neighbors. Herodotus seems to be skeptical about the existence of Hyperborea, but nevertheless informs his readers that this mythical land has been mentioned by two of ancient Greece's most revered poets, Hesiod and Homer. None of the tribes living there, including the Scythians, have anything to say about the Hyperboreans. Perhaps the Isidons. Isidons do, but I do not think so. If they did, the Scythians would have stories about them too, just as they do about the one-eyed people. Hesiod, however, has mentioned the Hyperboreans, and so has Homer in the Epigoni. Epigoni. If indeed Homer is the author of this poem, Herodotus then points out that most of the stories about Hyperborea are told by the inhabitants of the sacred island of Delos. 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 The overwhelming majority of the stories about the Hyperboreans come from Delos. The historian goes on to relate some of the tales about the Hyperboreans, in which Delos, as one might expect, plays a prominent role. One of these, for instance, relates to the way sacred objects were transported from Hyperborea to Delos. Delians. The Delians say that sacred objects are tied up inside a bundle of wheat, straws, and are transported from the Hyperboreans first to Scythia, then westward as far as possible, Adriatic, through a chain of successive neighboring tribes, then south to Dodona, Dodona, which is the first Greek community to receive them, then to the Gulf of Melia, Melia. where they cross the Euboea. Euboea. Euboea, where they are passed from town to town until they reach Charistus. 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 At which stage? Andros. Andros is omitted because the Charistans. Charistans are the ones taking them to Tinos. Tinos. And from Tinos, the objects are conveyed to. Delos. So this is how these sacred objects are said to reach Delos. The next story provided by Herodotus explains why the sacred objects were delivered in such a manner. According to the historian, 
The first time the sacred objects were sent to Delos, they were carried by two Hyperborean women. Hyperosh. Hyperosh. Leotis. And Leotis. According to the Delians. Delians. The women were accompanied by five Hyperborean men who protected them and served as their escorts. These envoys, however, never returned home, causing the rest of the Hyperboreans to worry that the people they sent to deliver sacred objects in the future would not come back either. Therefore, they devised the method in which the objects were passed from one group of people to another until they arrived in Delos. Herodotus states that the Hyperachi, Hyperosh, Hyperosh, and Lodis accomplished their mission and stayed in Delos rather than returning home. After their deaths, the women were worshipped by the Delians. Delians and commemorated in a special ritual. Now the death of the young woman who came from the Hyperboreans is commemorated on Delos by a hair-cutting ritual performed by the girls and boys of the island. Before they get married, the girls cut off a lock of hair, wind it around a spindle, and put it on the tomb which is inside the sanctuary of Artemis. Artemis. On the left, as one enters, an olive tree has grown over it, and the Dalian boys wind some of their hair around a twig and put it on the tomb as well, so that it is how these Hyperborean women are worshipped by the inhabitants of Delos. Herodotus' last story about the Hyperboreans is that of Arge and Opiates, Arge and Opiates a pair of women who traveled from Hyperborea to Delos. The women are said to have made the journey. The women are said to have made the journey before Hyperocean Laotis. Hyperocean Laotis. Though for a different purpose Arge and Opiis. Arge and Opus went to the island in order to pay tribute to Elethia. Elethia, the Greek goddess of childbirth, in exchange for a quick and easy labor at childbirth. According to Herodotus, the Delians claimed that the two women were accompanied by the gods themselves and received different honors when they came to Delos. The women, Delos, the women of the island, begged gifts from Arge and Opus whilst calling on the pair by name in the words of the hymn composed by Olin of Lycia in their honor. This practice has spread from Delos to other Aegean islands and Ionia. Like Hyperocean Lodice, the tombs of Arge and Opus are also found on the island. This tomb of theirs is situated behind the grounds of the sanctuary of Artemis, facing east, right next to the banqueting hall of the Seans. Seans. Before ending this discussion about Hyperborea, Herodotus mentions in passing a figure called Iberus. As the historian says that he was not going to repeat the story of Iberus, it may be assumed that Herodotus' readers were familiar with this tale. In any case, we learn from Herodotus that this Iberus was believed to be a Hyperborean, and that he carried an arrow all the way around the world without eating anything. Now that's where I always thought that maybe they were mistaken there, and he was flying the arrow. It was just a thought. Herodotus ends this section with a playful suggestion about people living beyond the south wind. But if there are Hyperboreans, there should also be Hyperian Oceans. Hyperian Scientists discovered an energetic cosmic serpent. Oceans. People living beyond the south wind. Pliny the Elder and Hyperborea. Although Herodotus provides several stories related to the Hyperboreans, he does not talk much about Hyperborea itself apart from its general location. Therefore, one has to... Worlds in Collision, Chapter 2 Planet Earth The planet Earth has a stony shell. The lithosphere, it consists of igneous rock, like granite and basalt. The sedimentary relies on other ancient sources to fill in the gaps left by Herodotus. One such source is Natural History, written by Pliny the Elder, the Roman naturalist and natural philosopher. Pliny mentions the Hyperboreans, in Book 4 of his work, and begins with the general location of Hyperborea, along the Black Sea, coast of Europe, as far as the River Tanis. Tanais. Tanais. Known today as the Don, are the... Mayote. Mayote, from whom the lake derives its name, and the last of all in the rear of them is... Aramaspi. Aramaspi, 
like Asti Splamanti. We then come to the Riffian Mountains, and the region known by the name of Terraforas. Terraforas, feathers, a part of the world which has been condemned by the decree of nature to lie immersed in thick darkness, suited for nothing but the generation of coal, and to be the asylum by the chilling blast of the northern winds. Behind these mountains, and beyond the region of the northern winds, there dwells, if we choose to believe it, a happy race known as the Hyperboreans. Pliny the Elder of Rome, who also wrote a lot about Hyperborea, like Herodotus before him, Pliny seems to express his doubts about the existence of the Hyperborean. Unlike the Greek historian, however, Pliny does not go straight into Delian-related Delian Hyperborean stories. Incidentally, the story about the Hyperborean sending sacred objects to Delos via neighboring tribes can be found at the end of Pliny's account of Hyperborea. Instead, Pliny provides his readers with more details about Hyperborea itself. At this spot are supposed to be the hinges upon which the world revolves, and the extreme limits of the revolutions of the stars. Here we find light for six months together, given by the sun in one continuous day. Who does not, however, as some ignorant persons have asserted, conceal himself from the vernal equinox to autumn? On the contrary, to these people there is but one rising of the sun per year, and that at the summer solstice, and but one setting at the winter solstice. This region, warmed by the rays of the sun, is of a most delightful temperature, and exempt from every noxious blast. Pliny continues his account with information about the Hyperboreans themselves, apart from referring to the Hyperboreans, a race that lives to an extreme old age, earlier on, Pliny also wrote the following. The abodes of the natives are the woods and groves, and gods receive their worship singly and in groups, while all discord and every kind of sickness are things utterly unknown. Death comes upon them only when satis satiated. satiated with life. After a career of feasting, in an old age sated with every luxury, they leap from a certain rock there into the sea, and this they deem the most desirable mode of ending existence. From Pliny's work, it is clear that even in ancient times, the exact location of Hyperborea was a puzzle. Several competing hypotheses about Hyperborea's actual whereabouts are mentioned by the Roman writer. For instance, Pliny mentions some ancient writers claim that Hyperborea is located at the edge of the shores of Asia. These writers argued that the people called the Atticori, Atticori. who resemble the Hyperboreans, lived in that region, which has very similar conditions to Hyperborea. Other writers argued that the region lies midway between the two suns, at the spot where it sets Antipodes. to the Antipodes and rises to us. Pliny discounts this hypothesis, considering the vast tract of sea there intervenes. A third hypothesis states that Hyperborea is located nowhere, nowhere but under a day which lasts for six months and the Hyperboreans sow in the morning, reap at midday, gather the fruits of the trees at sunset, and conceal themselves in caves at night. Hyperborea is also mentioned in works by ancient poets. This poetic works provide us with more information about this mythical land. The Hyperboreans, for instance, appear in Pindar's Olympian Ode Three. In his poem, Pindar claims that Heracles Hercules. Heracles. Heracles had traveled to Hyperborea to obtain an olive tree from its inhabitants. The hero begged for the tree to make shade for all men to share, and for brave deeds of valorous spirits a crown. In another poem, Pythian Ode. Pythian. Pythian Ode 10. Pendar places the slaying of Medusa by Perseus in Hyperborea, and paints the region as a place of great happiness. The muse is not absent from their customs. All around swirl the dances of girls, and lyres cloud chords and the cities of flutes. They wreathe their hair with golden laurel branches, and reveal joyfully no sickness or ruinous old age is mixed into the sacred race. Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, and Pindar were not only ancient authors who wrote about Hyperborea, 
Other well-known figures who mentioned this mythical region include Pausanias, Pausanias, Diodorus Siculus, Ovid, and Strabo. The large amount of work written about Hyperborea by these ancient authors shows that there was a great fascination with this land. As a matter of fact, this fascination has survived to this day, as some have sought to identify the location of Hyperborea, which may help to prove its existence. Nevertheless, there is still no consensus to the location of Hyperborea, assuming this paradise even exists in the first place. Wu Mengren from ancientorigins.net The Dark Age in Asia Minor Like Greece and the Aegean, Asia Minor has no history for a period of close to five centuries. Certain scholars disagree with this verdict, but it comes from the pen of one of the foremost authorities on archaeology and art of Asia Minor, Professor Ekram Hunches. Ekram a gurgle of the University of Ankara. Today, 1961, despite all industrious archaeological exploration of the last decades, the period from 1200 to 750, for most parts of the Anatolian region, lies still in complete darkness. The old nations of Asia Minor, like the Lycians and the Carians, the names of whatever happened to real science. Just as much of modern science has become self-serving and striving for status and funding, the theory of how science should be done, of which are mentioned in the documents of the second half of the second millennium, are archaeologically, i.e., with their material heritage, first noticeable about 700 or later. Hence, the cultural remains of the time between 1200 and 750 in central Anatolia, especially on the plateau, seem to be quite irretrievably lost for us. The huge land of Asia Minor for almost five centuries is historically and archaeologically void. The cause of the interruption in the flow of history, about 1200 BC, is assumed to lie in some military conquest. But the Phrygians, who are supposed to have been these conquerors, did not themselves leave any sign of their occupation of the country from before 750 BC. Thus the explanation that the end of the Anatolian civilization, about 1200, was due to the incursion of the Phrygians, is not supported by the archaeological finds. Accordingly to Akurgal, the repeatedly undertaken efforts to close the hiatus by relics of Phrygian art cannot be harmonized with the results of the archaeological study. None of the Phrygian finds, and none of the oriental ones found with them, can be dated earlier than the 8th century. Such results compel us to exclude from study of Asia Minor between 1200 and 750 any Phrygian presence and heritage. If there is no Phrygian occupation for the period, are there possibly some vestiges of occupation by other peoples? It is startling, writes Akurgal. It's a funny name, Akurgal. Not until now in central Anatolia, not only no Phrygian, Phrygian, but altogether no cultural remains of any people came to light that could be dated in time between 1200 and 750. Nothing was left by any possible survivors of previous occupants, namely the Hittite, namely by Hittites, and nothing by any people or tribe that could have supplanted them. Also, on the rim of Asia Minor, the darkness of the Dark Age is complete. In the south of the peninsula, in Mersin, Tarsius, and Karatepe, in recent years, important archaeological work was done. Here, too, the early Iron Age, i.e., the period between 1200 and 750, is enwrapped in darkness. Even after only a few decades of settlement, a town should leave discernible relics for archaeologists, usually under such circumstances, potsherds, or a few beads or a clay figurine are found. Ash and kitchen refuse are ubiquitous finds wherever there was human habitation. But that, on an area over 250,000 square miles, in extent there should, as Akurgal claims, be found nothing, not even tombs from a period counted not just by decades, but by centuries, actually a period of almost 500 years, is hardly less than miraculous. References Akurgal, Die Kunst 
Anatolians, von Homer, Bis, Alexander, Berlin, 1961, page 5 through 7. C.F. His Frigish Kunst, Akara, 1955, The Ibid, page 7. To give a summary of my interest and position in the debate about the Saturnian configuration, I was one of the early science undergraduates in the late 50s who had read Velikovsky's works before in the halls of academia. To my surprise and profound disillusionment with quote-unquote experts, I soon discovered that this was not so. I then began to do what Dave has done, and looked for further evidence, working on my own. So far as I know, I was the only science undergraduate who haunted the anthropology section of the library bookshelves. It was enough to convince me that there was a major case to be explored for a recent rearrangement of the solar system. I did not pursue the mytho-historical threads, since my first love is astronomy. But I have applied the same principles in that field that Dave has done in his work. That is, pattern recognition and matching. The results have been very encouraging and interesting. I should state my prejudices concerning the present state of science. I would characterize the scientific age as being the age of Homo sapien ignoramus, to be specific about our ignorance in the areas most likely to affect the Saturnian configuration. I would list the following. Gravity. Einstein, with his geometric description of gravity, has held back understanding by the better part of a century. The most promising work in explaining gravity is being done by a handful of classical physicists who see it as a minute imbalance in electrostatic forces associated with fundamental particles. The recent announcement of the accidental discovery of gravitational shielding by a rotating superconductor seems congruent with the classical approach. It certainly could not be predicted from the current metaphysics of gravity theory. Electrical discharges, this is crucial. We do not understand what causes earthly lightning, so we are unlikely to acknowledge plasma discharges in space. The little plasma physics that astronomers are taught is flawed. The plasmas are electrically neutral and superconducting. They trap magnetic fields. So apart from gravity, magnetism is the only other force we hear about. We are told that energetic events on the sun are due to magnetic reconnection, whatever that means. The strongest force, barring nuclear, electrical, is never mentioned. We find it easy on Earth to generate x-rays using electric discharge, but astronomers insist on nature doing it the hard way in space. It is also not generally known that electrical discharges are very efficient at removing material against gravity and dumping it into space or onto another nearby object stars we do not understand what makes them tick as ralph jurgen said in the 70s practically every feature of our sun has no business being there if it is purely a thermonuclear engine radiating into space magnetic fields do not occur without an associated electric current the sun is essentially an extended conducting plasma subject to electric stress the phenomenon we call the sun is purely a ball of lightning. That the Earth and other planets intercept some of the galactic plasma discharge is shown by the recent discovery of diffuse stratospheric discharges, sprites, x-rays, and gamma rays above earthly storms. This is a precise analog of the corona x-rays chromospheric glow discharge, and photospheric lightning. Granulations are the tops of the discharges on the sun. The umbra of a sunspot gives us a glimpse of the true temperature of the body of the sun. As a result of this realization, it follows that the conventional stellar evolutionary story is pure fiction. Stars are what they are because of their environment. Their variability is caused by their environment, not their internal workings. This explains the speed with which some stars change their characteristics. Heavy elements are not built up slowly in supernovae, but at the surface of all stars, in the non-thermal compression and acceleration of plasma discharges, granulations. Hence, Nucleosynthesis and what little neutrino production there is fall as the sunspot number increases. 
The differential rotation of the sun, its magnetic field, and the sunspot cycle are all influenced by the sun's passage across large Birkeland currents, flowing along and defining the arms of our galaxy. Planet Formation The Laplacian theory and its variants are garbage. The Hubble Space Telescope has shown in the Hubble Space Telescope has shown that in regions of star formation, large bodies are being shot out as if from a gun, which is peculiar if gravity is the operative force. Once again, plasma discharges provide a mechanism which can simply explain this. The view is that diffuse hydrogen and dust is efficiently scavenged and compressed by the well-known magnetic pinch effect of an electric current flowing along the arms of a galaxy. At some point, gravity takes over and stellar objects are formed. Beyond a certain size, protostars become electrically unstable and fission, spitting out some of the core and giving rise to one or more companions. So uh, there, I still think that the Herbie Harrow objects must might have something to do with the formation of planets as well. So there seems to be more than one way for a planet to be made. But when we're looking at planets, it's very possible that we could be looking at the core of a star. That's interesting. This explains the predilection for stars to be found in pairs or multiples. Got that right. Not all the matter ejected from the core of a protostar may coalesce into a companion star. It may be in the form of one or a number of gas giants. The recent discovery of a Jupiter-like body orbiting very close to a nearby star argues strongly for this model and against the standard theory. A gas giant, in turn, due to either internal or external electrical disturbance, may fission spitting out its core to give rise to the highly condensed planets, moons, asteroids, comets, etc. Cosmology All of the above gives rise to the conviction that cosmology should be in the hands of the, the plasma physics experimenters, not the theorists. It is ironic that they have been chasing the holy grail of fusion power, just like the sun, when that is patently wrong. Interestingly, a recent breakthrough in fusion energy research came about in my hometown, Canberra. When the researchers configured their plasma discharge in the form of a Birkeland current ring, a precise analog of that flowing along the arms of our galaxy. But astronomers will continue to be surprised by results pouring in from space probes when their fundamental paradigms rest on Newtonian and billiard ball physics. The current paradigm has no predictive power whatsoever. The book The Big Bang Never Happened by Eric J. Lerner is a pointer to the cosmology of the 21st century. So what are the patterns that apply from all of this to the Saturnian configuration, SC? The following are some ideas. One. The core discharge mechanism of planet formation is a plausible way to generate the SC, a string of objects with the largest near the middle. It's a Saturnian configuration, SC. Two, the reliance on the degree of electrical stress in the enveloping plasma for the characteristics of the larger bodies enclosed in that plasma could see rapid changes occur even the disruption of one of the stellar or gas giant objects. It could certainly involve jets of material being emitted by such bodies and forming a diffuse cloud enveloping the polar configuration. It could also be the destabilizing influence which finally breaks it up. 3. As seen in the high-speed objects shooting out of the Orion Nebula, Plasma discharges take place in the core of a star, or gas giant, can result in considerable acceleration of the resultant debris. This may provide some of the source of the energy required 
to position Jupiter and Saturn much further out in our solar system. The redistribution of charge amongst objects in the solar radial field also requires that their orbits will change. 4. Charged bodies orbiting eccentrically in a radial electric field around the Sun will dissipate energy through electromagnetic induction heating in such a way as to quickly spiral into a circular orbit. For any object with a high eccentricity, electrical breakdown will occur within its Langmuir sheath, and cometary discharge phenomena will be seen, regardless of its size. Venus. 5. If gravity is essentially an electrostatic phenomenon, the unusual environment of the Saturnian configuration could be expected to have caused a difference in the perceived gravity at the surface of the Earth. It is conceivable that the electric stress within the plasma sheath enclosing the SC was less than that which the Earth endures in its current solar environment. This would result in an effect of lower gravity. The breakup of the SC would have caused a sudden change. An interesting sidelight to this idea is that the apparent very low density of Saturn may be due to the use of a universal gravitational constant in the determination. There may be no such thing. Measurements of G in laboratories on Earth don't seem to agree. In Saturn's electrical environment, we may have shared an apparent low gravity. 6. Various odd phenomena associated with plasma discharges would have been observed from Earth and should appear in ancient depictions of the SC. These include helical, serpentine glows surrounding a central column, or twined rope-like around each other. These would be representations of Brooklyn currents flowing between planets enveloped in the same plasma sheath. The number of strands may have varied and given rise to the depictions of Venus with different numbers of radiance. We should also look at the photographs from deep space of exploding stars. For clues to the imagery, since they are electric discharge phenomena writ large, one, they could possibly look like rings around the column, or a series of flared skirts. Another effect is seen in discharge tubes filled with low-pressure gas, where a series of light and dark bands are formed transverse to the discharge axis. This might give rise to a kind of stairway to heaven or ziggurat appearance. Then there is the self-contained plasmoid, a corkscrew within an overall football shape which forms the interplanetary equivalent of lightning and appears to have been depicted as Zeus Thunderbolt. I have looked in some detail at chondritic meteorites, which I expect to be leftovers from a planetary discharge event. They show all the characteristics to be expected of material that has been subjected to flash heating, acceleration, collision, and ion implantation in a spatially restricted compressed gas stream together with isotopic modification by enhanced radiation followed by sudden cooling, all the symptoms of a plasma discharge. I predicted that the features of the enigmatic chondrule shells could be reproduced in the lab in a plasma oven. A planetary discharge is a very effective way for Martian meteorites to have been created. Very strong evidence for planetary electrical scarring comes from the Magellan Orbiter images of Venus, also the Jovian moon Europa, was presumably a part of the Saturnian configuration and would also have been subject to electrical scarring. I predict that when close-ups of Europa are available in December, the so-called cracks in the ice will be found to be electric discharge channels with the raised levees on either side of the dark light, dark cross section caused by discharge modification of the excavated material. In the manner of the green glass beads, formed from the melted soil excavated by an electric discharge, 
along the lunar rails. 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 The cracks on Europa show no lateral displacement where they intersect, though displacement would be expected if they were due to shifting ice. Discharge channels will throw material from the younger channel into the older where they intersect. Cracks should not show this characteristic. After that, I need a long, cold foster. Walthorn. <laughs> Can you believe that hot track is uh, a backs uh, like a backup song, like I, what they call them, where you can jam along with them? The guy is just a great player. Um, I'll put a link in the description in case anybody's interested. Yeah, he's got good music too. Um, okay, well I'm gonna say good night. I don't want to make this too long. Just wanted to get a little bit of a. Uh, live stream going and it was fun it was cool it took a little bit but i'm gonna come back soon with something a little more planned this was just an impromptu thing so i'm gonna leave you with the electric universe and um i'll see you soon okay i hope you enjoyed the show the premiere earlier it was just a lot of fun i'll talk to you later What uh, do you think uh, is the effect of this collective amnesia in the future? Their effect is very great. Not very easy to treat those things in the past. Because as long as a man doesn't remember his past, he acts as a neurotic, a person who suffered a traumatic experience. Due to this traumatic experience, suffered also an amnesia, a local amnesia, so to say, not spread off through all his personality. But in this case, in the human race, we have something that is comparable with a single personality that suffered its own.
are no islands in space. And in fact, this is the world. Good night. Happy New Year.